Good morning, everyone. I'm Chancellor Dondi Plowman. Tomorrow is the first day of class, and there's so much going on as we launch into the fall semester. It's really great to see our community back together again. Just this past few days, I visited with 60 upperclassmen who are tutors and student success, student success coaches. They're eager and excited to help our entering freshmen get off to a great start. I visited with RAs and hall directors. You know, last night we had torch night. We had to do it differently. Everything's different. We did torch night outside and the students didn't get to light the candle, but they, they used glow sticks and we had fireworks and we passed the torch of preparation to the entering class of freshmen that are here. So thank you all for joining this week's live update. And thank you to all of you who sent in questions and feedback. Again, it's shaping the content of today's uh, conversation. I hope this will be a conversation. I'm joined by Provost John Zomchik, uh, Dr. Spencer Gregg, who's been guiding us on medical issues and healthcare, and Vice Chancellor for Student Life, Frank Cuevas. For thanks, thanks you all for being here. So based on the, the questions and feedback since last Thursday, uh, we, I want to spend our time today doing three things. First, we're going to talk about the data, the new data related to case counts. Uh, we've also, secondly, we've identified our first cluster of five cases. We're going to talk about what a cluster is. That was linked to an off-campus party, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, we'll fill you in on the specifics and how we're going to respond, where there's going to be some new campus policies in place, and what you can expect related to communicating about clusters on campus. And thirdly, we're going to talk about how we will communicate rooms that get cleaned as a result of a positive or a suspected COVID case. We're no longer calling them closures because we don't really close anything down except for uh, a short period when we, we clean it. But we'll talk about how we're going to communicate that. So let's talk about the data. We have seen an increase in the total active case counts um, and the total isolation since last Thursday's update. That's not surprising. If you think about it, look at what's uh, on this graph here. So this is on the website. And what you see today is that we have a total of 75 active positive COVID-19 cases on our campus. 66 of those are students. Nine of them are employees. Now let's think about that. That's an increase in the student count since our first live briefing, which was last Thursday on August 13th. So look, look at where the point was on the 13th and look at where we are today. At Thursday's briefing, the number of positive cases for students was 28. And as I just said today, the number is 66. You can see this on the website. As I said on August 13th, those 28 cases were largely students who'd been here, prolonged cases over the summer. Um, and now we've moved in 6,500 students. So we expected this number to go up. It will continue to go up for a while. Let's just think about that. But it just dramatizes the importance for all of us in being vigilant about wearing our masks, about social distancing and washing our hands. So that's the number of isolation cases. What you see there, if you look at that uh, blue line across the bottom, that is employees. That number is actually, that's faculty and staff is down a tiny bit. But overall, the number of uh, positive cases is up as we expected it to happen because we've now moved 6,500 students back on campus and the additional students making up over 30,000 this year, are off campus uh, in apartments uh, and living at home around the community. So let's talk for a minute about quarantine and isolations. That's on the next chart that you will see on the website. So if you, we are gonna be posting this, you can look at it day by day. So let's look at this, let's, let's go to August 17th, which was yesterday. So all the numbers I'm reporting on are numbers as of last night. And that's always how the case count will appear on the website. So when you go this morning and look, what you'll see is as of last night, these are the counts that we had. So let's look at that number. The campus community now has a total of 270 people in isolation that are self-isolating. So let's think about that for a minute. It's important to note that many of the people in isolation have not come to campus. There are currently, if you look at this chart, 
uh, employees are at the bottom. The green part of that bar is students who are living on campus. And the blue part are students who are non-residential. So look at this. There are currently 187 students in quarantine or isolation. Of those, 51 of them live on campus. So that green part, that's 51 students, dorm students. We've moved in 6,500 students and we have 51 students self-isolate. So, so just I want, it's important that everyone put those numbers in context. We're also breaking down, let's, let's talk about why students are self-isolating. We're breaking them down on the website and you can see the reason, reasons. So if you look at this, 40, almost 42% of the students are self-isolating because they have been in close contact with someone who has tested positive. You can see there that 27% of them are self-isolating because they've developed symptoms, but they don't know yet as of last night if they were positive. 21.6% of them are students who have tested positive. And then there's a small category that are self-isolating for other reasons. So I think it's really important for us to see you know, what I just, we talked about positive cases, we talked about the number of isolations, and, and what you see here are the reasons that students are self-isolating. So let's think about this for a minute. As it relates to the, uh, these numbers, I wanna ask Dr. Gregg, is there anything in here that seems surprising to you as our head physician who's helping us guide this? Any surprises in this? Uh, I don't think so, Dr. Plowman. Although our, our numbers of positive cases and the use of our isolation and quarantine spaces on campus were expected to increase as students, faculty, staff return to our campus. It's important to understand that ongoing increases are, are not necessarily inevitable. If our campus community can adhere to the basic health and safety guidance that we put out, like avoiding close contact, staying at least six feet away from others, and if you must be within six feet, make it for a short amount of time as possible and always less than 10 minutes, wearing your mask when you're around others, washing your hands, avoid gathering in groups, just basic measures, then these increases can be curbed. We've seen this in multiple communities where these measures have been uh, pursued, including right here in Knox County. So uh, Dr. Greg, just one other question. As you continue to watch these, you, you know more about this than anyone. What are the things you're gonna continue to look for every day when you look at these numbers? I know the things I'm looking for, but I'd like to hear what you're looking for. Well, the main thing we wanna see is that, that um, there's a flattening of this upward traje trajectory in, in the positive cases. And this can only be achieved if we're all doing our part in protecting ourselves and each other. Uh, we've committed to being on campus because there was such a demand for it by our students and their families. And we're only gonna be successful if we all play by the rules and follow our health and safety guidance. Okay. So I would say the additional thing that people ask me, what am I looking for? We talked about this last week. What are gonna be the indicators that would cause us to alter from our plan? And I would say, if you, you can step back and think about it, this, it, what is our operational capacity to deliver on our mission safely and keep people safe? So I'm gonna be also looking very closely at faculty and staff. That's delivering our mission is being able to deliver our courses, um, whether it's you know online, hybrid, face-to-face. -face. And I fully expect that we may see an, a trend moving towards more of our courses being online. They move may, a, a, as the semester goes on, we may see them move back the other way. So I'm looking, I, for, for me, a big issue in addition to what you just said was our being able to deliver on our mission and related to operational capacity, I would say is, how are we doing with isolation spaces and being able to uh, self quarantine? And, and right now, the numbers you, you see on the, you can see it on the website where we are with students, residential students who are self-isolating. Many of them, most of them are doing it at home. So like the latest data that I've seen is we're only using um, 24 beds of our isolation beds for our residential students. And we have 240 beds in total. What would we do if we got to the point where we had more students needing self-isolating spaces than we have? We've said before, at that point, we will be asking students to self-isolate somewhere else, either at home 
maybe their parents can come to town and hopefully we're not going to reach that stage that, and they could rent a hotel room where they can isolate together with their mom and dad or family members or whatever. So those are the things in addition that I'm going to be looking for. And I just wanted to share that with the community. Um, one other thing, let me just say, I think last Thursday, and we're learning as we do this, we're going to continue to adapt. We had said we would be updating our numbers twice a week, trying to figure out how to do that. We've adjusted that. We're going to be updating them uh, five days a week. So every morning, Monday through Friday, you will see the case count that we had have effective the night before. On Monday morning, we will update for what we've learned over the weekend. So you can count on daily information. So I want to I want to talk for a minute about a cluster because we now have a cluster, and um, I want I want to turn again to Dr. Greg to help us define what is a cluster and why do we care about clusters. Well, clusters can be defined as different levels for different uh, circumstances, but specifically for our campus, a cluster of cases is defined as five connected positive cases or 20 connected close contacts of a positive case or cases. Okay, so, so we now have our first cluster uh, and it was related to an off-campus party at Laurel Avenue last Tuesday. And, and I'm gonna say a little bit more here about how we're gonna be dealing with these situations as they come up, but that's what people should know. Uh, we know students have missed their friends and they want to connect, but they have to do it safely. And if they're on this call, you have to do it safely. And doing it safely means not in large gatherings and it, without um, your, your mask or staying socially distanced. So um, would you say, Dr. Greg, that this event that we had last week, we've had contract, contact tracing. My understanding is it related to at least that party, the, the tracing has been successful. Whoops, you're on, we're still on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, let me uh, discuss a little bit about clusters and how they're determined and how long they can take. Um, clusters can usually only be identified with rapid identification of a positive case, uh, then a thorough case investigation of that case index, uh, and then vigorous contact tracing efforts. Time is of the essence to stop the spread of infection from a cluster. Therefore, adhering to uh, our reporting process is imperative. Completing that daily health self-check app prior to coming to or being out on campus, completing a self-isolation form if directed to do so by that uh, daily health self-check app or a healthcare provider or a contact tracer or anytime if you're needing to self-isolate, completing that form. And then, and this is key, is full cooperation with that contact tracing process. The quicker the steps are completed, the faster the investigation can proceed and the greater the likelihood the spread of infection can be mitigated. We ideally wanna complete a case investigation within 24 hours of notification of a positive case and contact tracing should be completed within 48 or at least should be initiated within 48 hours or sooner if possible. So let's talk about a little bit more about clusters. We wanna be transparent about clusters we will include that information on the data page of the website regarding clusters if we know it. If we have it, it will be there. If we cannot confirm that there's a cluster and we need to alert people that they could have come into contact with someone who's part of a cluster because they were at an off-campus party, uh, we will send an email notification to campus or to an appropriate segment of the campus So uh, and then post to the website. So I want to talk for a minute about, about responsibility and cooperation. We have said from the beginning that we want to be creative, compassionate, and flexible. Every one of those is a two-way street. Being compassionate requires curbing behavior because you're caring about someone else. Not all students already are coordinating, are cooperating with contact tracing efforts, and some are refusing to fill out the self-isolation forms. So Dr. Gregg, will you talk about why that's a problem and why that is a health risk for everyone else when people won't cooperate? Yes, when you're not forthcoming with information, you significantly hamper our contact tracing efforts. It's, it's a lot like not being fully honest about your symptoms or your concerns when you're talking to your own healthcare provider. Uh, we're, we can only make decisions based upon the information that's been provided to us. And so the goal of contact tracing is, is not to be punitive. 
is to provide protection to the community as a whole. And that's why that information has to be uh, quickly forthcoming and honest. When you fail to participate, you're, you're failing to help others in need, and that's certainly not consistent with the volunteer spirit. So I want to be very clear here. There will not be a punishment associated with telling a contact tracer you were somewhere, even if there was underage drinking. But there will be the harshest punishment I can think about it for someone who willfully does not cooperate with contact tracing uh, or filling out the self form. This is what is going to preserve our community's ability to manage through this. And if, if students do not cooperate, you could be expelled for that. So just listen to that very carefully. If students do not cooperate with contact tra tracers or with filling out the self-isolation form, we will pursue, if we need to, student conduct and ultimately expelling a student from campus. And why would we do that? Because you are risking the health and welfare of everyone else here. So I hope I've been clear about that. This morning, I walked through Fort Sanders. I was there with people who live there, who own homes there, who own rental properties there. I was with the UT uh, PD, UT Police Department and, and Knoxville Police Department are, work, are working together to help patrol that area. If you host a party with that's a large gathering and that does not meet the mask or social distancing requirements, you are endangering the health and well being of the campus and the Knoxville community. We will hold the party hosts accountable. We know who lives there. I was on the front porch this morning of one of those parties. They were all asleep. I actually knocked on the door if you want to know the truth. Uh, we will hold you responsible. And it's possible that you could be expelled from school. And I will not hesitate to do that if people, our students are irresponsible. I'm saying to the upperclassmen right now, I wish you would watch the freshmen. They are so eager to be here. They have moved in following all the rules. They're wearing their face masks. They're social distancing as best they can. And it is compassion is partly on you to help them have a, a successful campus experience as well. So uh, Vice Chancellor Cuevas, well, I'm gonna turn to you for a second. I know that you've been in conversations with, about, with student organizations, with the Greek community. Talk to us a little bit about the plans you all have made and how you are working on this very issue. We've had a number of conversations over the summer months with our members of our Greek community and other student organizations to really emphasize this notion of, we need to do this in partnership. And everyone needs to really follow all the health and safety guidelines uh, to help keep our campus and community safe. In addition to the social distancing, the face coverings and what have you, we're, we've told our students, gatherings, events need to be small. Small in number, but still practicing social distancing guidelines and the face coverings and all those other elements. It is a true, as you said earlier, it's a true partnership. Hand in hand, we have to work together, just as we were working with our Fort Sanders community as we were walking through this morning. All those elements is what we share with our student organizations and our Greek leaders and their advisors. Uh, later today, we'll be communicating with, again, as a follow-up to all of our students regarding these in instances and what they need to do to keep everyone safe. One of the things the students need to look for is that later today or tomorrow morning, we'll be issuing clarifications on some more restrictive policies about the size of gatherings for students. So you can look forward to that. The last thing I wanna talk about is room cleaning information because there was a lot of a question and concern about that. We've heard from a number of you. So let me walk through what we're doing. What we're doing now is very different than what we were doing in March and April when we were shutting down entire buildings to clean a single room. Rooms are being cleaned and disinfected routinely. Public, every public space on this campus is cleaned uh, and disinfected every evening. Special cleaning occurs in areas where someone has tested positive or is suspected of having uh, been pos positive. When we know that, we will go to that space, uh, put a sign on the door, close it for probably not even an hour, uh, clean it, and then open it back up again. So we're not posting closures, but we will post uh, the rooms that we've cleaned for those purposes. Everything else you can expect, we're cleaning on a regular basis. So it's occurring, the cleaning is occurring much more quickly than it was in the spring, and the rooms are reopening very quickly. So we, we, we just actually couldn't 
couldn't post closed, open, closed, open, closed, open. But facility services uses the CDC and EPA guidelines for how we clean and disinfect. Really happy about what we're doing there. There's a guide on the UTK COVID website on cleaning and disinfecting that includes the memos outlining exactly how we're cleaning, the protocols, the ventilation. We understand that having the room information is important to a number of people on campus. So for that reason, we, have at, we are adding to the data page information that indicates, as you can see here, the rooms that have been cleaned due to COVID outside of the regular stepped up cleaning schedule. So, so look at this, on August 15th, there were three rooms that we felt we needed, we got word that someone in there either thought they might have had COVID or tested positive. So we went into the first floor rooms and patio in the law library. We went into a specific room in Natalie Haslam Music Center. We went into a private office in Claxton Education Building. You can see there we had to do something on the 16th in the union and two, uh, you know, closures, quick closures, clean cleansing in Pendergrass and one in the Aquatic Center. So that what you're what you're seeing there is uh, the kind of information we're going to post. So we'll we'll continue to put like a three day rolling basis, just like you see here. So this is not really room closure, but facility services will use signs to indicate if a room is closed and they're in there cleaning. So that's how we'll communicate the the minutes or hour couple of hours where we're actually cleaning, and then you'll be able to see a daily count. So please respect the signage. If you do see that, do not enter the rooms that are closed. This is an effort to be transparent as best we can about what rooms have been cleaned in response to a positive or suspected case, even though rooms may be cleaned and reopened relatively quickly. So I wanna just say to everyone, what we have to do is assume that every space has had a positive case. So students, when you walk into your room, get the wipe, wipe down your, your desk. And at the same time, we should all, I've heard Dr. Greg say this many times, assume everyone you come in contact with has the virus. When I go to the grocery store on the weekend, I do that. I assume everyone's infected and I wear my mask and I stay six feet apart. If someone approaches me, I step back. And those are the ways we're gonna keep each other safe. We will have our next regular update live this Friday at 1130. In between now and Friday, you can look, go to the website, look at the numbers. I want to stop for a minute, and I haven't turned to our provost, John Zomchik. John, is there any other update you ought to you want to give, or you can think about it in terms of classroom scheduling? How we're doing? Scheduling is just about set. We are eager to begin uh, the first day of classes tomorrow. I want to tell the faculty that if you if you're listening now, take confidence in uh, the chancellor's vigilance and rigor with which she is overseeing the health. Uh, and safety of our campus community. I feel very good about the opening uh, uh, first day of classes tomorrow, and I'm grateful to everyone who is, has contributed and will continue to contribute uh, to the great work that we do here uh, at Rocky Top. So thank you. I wanna to say to everyone in closing, we have a plan. We're gonna be deliberate. We're going to be thoughtful as we have been for these months planning this. We are going to learn, watch data, follow the science, listen to Dr. Gregg, listen to the health department, and proceed with caution. We can do this. To the students, I'm saying to you, I want you to listen again. The three values we've said from the beginning, the faculty and the staff have been working on this. So we're going to proceed with compassion. We're going to proceed uh, with creativity, and we're going to be flexible. Our first and primary goal is to keep our community healthy and hopeful, and students have a role to play in this. It is not compassionate when you host a party, attend a party, a large party, a gathering where people aren't social distancing. You need to remove yourself from that situation and find other ways to connect. It's for one semester. If we want a successful campus experience, if we want our freshmen to get to experience some of what the upperclassmen have experienced, if we want a football season, we've got to all work at this and do our part to keep everyone healthy and hopeful. We're trying everything we can to keep students on track towards success. And we're going to continue to be creative, compassionate, and flexible. All of those are a two-way street and we expect it of everyone. So thank you for joining us today and I'll see everyone again on Friday. Thank you very much.